President, Mr. Mbo, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Within life's span, there are days of special happiness, days of pride and days of humility. This is such a day for me. It represents the culmination of a vigorous effort, hope, and deep conviction that a significant change can be achieved in the environment in which Muslims live. This is also a day of gratitude, and I express my heartfelt thanks to the President and the Government of Pakistan for their encouragement in this endeavor and for offering us one of Pakistan's great national monuments on this occasion. The presence of Mr. Mbo, the Director General of the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, the world's largest agency for the preservation and support of man's culture, is also a source of strong encouragement. I express my thanks to him for participating with us in this important effort. To the Governor of the Punjab and people of Lahore, I extend greetings and gratitude for their welcome and hospitality. We are gathered here today to recognize the work of men and women who, we believe and hope, will have a profound impact on the environment of Muslims in the years ahead. The first series of awards in architecture within the vast community of Muslims are about to be given. It is well to ponder at this time about what they mean, what questions they raise, what implications they may have for the future, as well as for our deeper collective concern for the continuous integrity of Islamic architecture and through architecture for the whole of Islamic culture. I trust and hope that over the years, scholars, architects, planners, officials at all levels, and users will discuss among themselves the significance of the choice made by the jury out of 180 submitted buildings and architectural ensemble. Many, at time, even contradictory conclusions could and should be drawn from the jury's decisions and at the very outset, I would like to share with you some impressions, some thoughts, some queries, perhaps even a few worries about the results of these choices. First, let me recall that it is here in Pakistan that the idea of this award was made public some four years ago. It is in part for this reason that the first recipients of the award are gathered here to be recognized for their achievements. It is also in Pakistan that this event takes place because located roughly in the geographical center of Islam. Pakistan possesses some of the wonders of classic Islamic architecture, like the gardens which surround us. Some of the most genuine vernacular traditions, as was amply demonstrated in the exhibitions opened yesterday and some of the most important contemporary efforts within the Muslim world. It is only fitting that this microcosm of Islamic traditions serve as a host for the contemporary achievements of the whole Muslim world, from the arid shores of the Atlantic Ocean to the tropical splendor of Indonesian islands. Here, better perhaps than anywhere else, the richness and glory of the past and the creations of today can be seen in the context of a vibrant and exciting concern for the environment. For it is indeed this concern that we have come to celebrate. And we must recognize that we are not premiating a country, a city or a building, but the whole Muslim world as it enters into its 15th century of existence. Second, we may well ask 
whether the premiated projects truly represent the great traditions of Islamic architecture. There are no mosques among them, no madrasa, no palace, no garden, no mausoleum. None of the monuments which are visited by millions of tourists, cherished by those who live near them, and utilized by historians to define the Muslims' past. The paradox, however, is more apparent than real. For great though the celebrated monuments of the past are as works of art, they were only part of the built environment of the past. They were the creations of great and wealthy patrons, often made no doubt for the use and pleasure of the masses, but rarely lacking in personal or dynastic vanity. All too frequently, the settings developed by the masses themselves have been lost or changed out of recognition. In the contemporary world, the awards have recognized that other part, perhaps now much more important than in the past, the part of the common man, creating for himself and his neighbors a setting for life and health preserving and utilizing what nature has created, developing ways to maintain his identity rather than accepting the elephantine massiveness of so much of today's world. This recognition of a human scale, of local decisions, of local needs and concerns is, I believe, a profoundly Muslim requirement. It is the expression of that social concern for thousands of separate communities within the whole Ummah, which is so uniquely a central part of the Muslim message. We have recognized an architecture for men, women, and children, not yet an architecture for history books and tourists. Through architecture, we are recognizing the quality of life, within the Muslim world today. And by recognizing a housing project developed by a whole community or a medical center, we are preserving for all times the memory of this quality of life. There is a more deep and more intriguing side to this recognition which forms my third observation. These awards may indeed illustrate or sharpen an issue which has been sidetracked over the past 400 years as scholars and patrons became fascinated with the personalities of architects as artistic and formal creators. The issue is, what architecture are we recognizing? Is it the planning and design of master architects? Is it the architecture of craftsmen, artisans, and specialists of all sorts who put a building together? Is it the architecture of users? Is it the architecture of certain lands with their peculiar physical characteristics? Is it the architecture of a faith which transcends national, geographic, social, or technological limits? It is easy enough to answer yes to all questions and to identify the merits of any one project according to each one of these criteria. In part, the decisions of the jury have done that. But in a deeper sense, the important point is precisely that none of these criteria has taken precedence over any others. The implication is that we are recognizing as unique a creative and generative process in which the imagination of one architect or the expectation of Muslim patrons and users interact constantly. Within this continuum, no single moment or decision can be isolated like the element of a chemical compound. Because it is creative life itself, it is the elusive process of human existence which is the winner, not merely a monument. And finally, 
we may turn from the Muslim world to the whole world. Many of the issues which led to the creation of the awards are not unique to the Muslim world. They are issues found in all new lands, as on our shrinking planet, all new countries, or all developing countries grope for a visible self-identification of their own and for the satisfaction of new worldwide expectations about the quality of their lives. But why think only of new or developing countries? Social problems plague lands with the highest per capita income and self-identification is a concern of countries with the longest history of independence and expansion. It may be just that, as the award highlights the search of the Muslim world for an architecture centered on man and proclaiming the potential of life, an example is given to the whole world of how this can be done. In part, it is simply that the Muslim message is a universal one and not restricted to a few areas or a few ethnic groups. But in a deeper sense, what we are trying to achieve, this environment we are looking for, is not only ours. It is also something we want to share with the whole world, not as an exercise in pride or vanity, but because of our belief that the means at our disposal may allow us to sharpen issues, to discover solutions for all mankind to use and understand. Such are a few observations based on the awards themselves, on recognized achievements from Senegal to Indonesia, from humble houses to grand hotels, by architects and by masons, by anonymous bureaucracies or specific individuals and collectivities, by Muslims and by non-Muslims, yet always for Muslims. But this is not the end of our effort. It is, in fact, only the beginning, as we are about to embark on the process leading to the second award in 1983. And we seek to extend our network of nominated projects as we seek to refine the ways in which we judge, as we seek to anticipate issues and problems in organizing seminars and other kinds of research activities to help us better to understand the issues involved. And indeed it is appropriate at this time to mention these issues, or some of them, in public, in front of so many experts and decision makers deeply concerned with this construction of the 15th century of Islam. For without your help and cooperation, with ideas, with criticisms, with information, indeed your total commitment and creativity, we cannot succeed in meeting the challenges ahead. What are the challenges? The first one is perfectly exemplified by the very setting in which we meet, the magnificent Shalimar Gardens. From the very beginning, we felt that the award should be given in places of overwhelming historical and aesthetic interest. This is to remind us all of the great traditions to which we are the heirs. But what, in fact, is the relationship of our roots to what we are today? Surely we do not expect of contemporary architects, copies or imitations of the past. We know only too well how disastrous such copying has been. There are two things I feel we may appropriately seek from the past. One is what I would call our moral right to decide on the environment which will be ours. However useful and essential outside experts may be, However international contemporary architecture has become, our past, our roots, give us the right to say that the choices we make are our choices and that the opportunities we have today will do for the next decades what early Muslims did in Spain, Syria or Iraq, what Ottoman Turks, Timurids or Mughals did some five or six hundred years ago in Anatolia, Iran 
and India to understand what was available and appropriate in non-Muslim lands in order to create something profoundly Muslim. And this leads me to my second point about the monuments of our past. We must learn to understand them well, not simply to preserve them as museums of past glories, but to feel in every part of them a stone masonry, a brick dome, a window, an ornament or a garden arrangement. That unique spirit, that unique way which made these monuments Islamic. Only then will we be able to impart the same spirit to the technical means and to the forms of today. A second challenge is of a very different order. As time goes on, more and more of the major environmental and architectural programs within the Muslim world will utilize the high technology developed for the most part outside the Muslim world. As airports, office buildings, hospitals, schools, industrial complexes, whole new cities grow in numbers and in quality. They will quite naturally satisfy much less easily the originality of our traditions. The models of the past, even if available, will be technically or economically unsuited to new needs. These new creations will run the risk of becoming homogenized, internationalized monuments with an occasional arch or dome. But need it be so? While preserving and nurturing the immense variety of our vernacular architecture, how will we be able to channel the necessity of high technology without becoming its slaves? There are areas perhaps such as those of solar energy, of water conservation, of thermic control, or of prefabrication, where we can become leaders rather than followers, where our needs can revolutionize the rest of the world. And finally, let me mention one last challenge, the challenge of education. Not only do we know too little about ourselves, but we have not as yet been able to form in sufficient numbers our own experts and practitioners with the full competence to solve the environmental problems of tomorrow. Too many of our best minds are trained outside their own countries. Why is this so? Is it a matter of equipment and of facilities? Is it a question of teaching staff? Is it a peculiar trust in outside expertise? Clearly, we must develop ways to make our own schools of architecture and of planning places to which others will want to come. And this will require yet another kind of intellectual and practical effort. For even if we create an architecture worthy of praise, we would have partly failed unless we form ourselves, the men and women, who will realize that architecture. I do not claim that these are the only challenges left to us. Others exist, no doubt. But as we celebrate the first awards and open the way for the forthcoming ones, all these challenges can help us in defining the attitudes we must develop in thinking of the future and the areas of discovery open to us. It is a task we must accomplish together, fully acknowledging our diversities, but knowing as well that there is a straight path, which is the path of our faith.
Why did you decide to establish the award in the first place? I was concerned about the loss of cultural traditions, the impact that that would have on a part of the world which has had a remarkable tradition in architecture. And I felt that uh, the Islamic world needs to revive its traditions in the built environment which it's going to live in in the years ahead. Some Western influences on architectural designs in Islamic countries have been criticized. What kind of designs are they? It's difficult to generalize about Western architecture in the Islamic world. There's been some very fine architecture, as was shown by the award winners. There's also been some inappropriate architecture in terms of design content, in terms of cost, in terms of appropriateness to the society or the culture or just the climate of the countries involved. What I'm hoping is that people who design for the Islamic world in the future will seek to understand that part of the world better 
before they design. Is one of the thrusts of your award, in fact, perhaps to stimulate better design in what we call mass housing, in urbanization? Yes, that's correct. Uh, the Islamic world really is, uh, for most part, highly uh, densely populated, and housing is a requirement of a very special nature. And we simply have got to find, I think, ways and means of providing uh, appropriate housing for very, very large numbers of people. That is a, a requirement which is infinitely greater than anywhere else outside the Islamic world, or let's say outside the third world. There's clearly a spiritual thrust behind this award as well, isn't there? Uh, yes, to the extent that uh, the award is interested in, or has a, as an objective, to encourage good architecture in the Islamic world. Uh, the guiding principles of Islam, therefore, are a uh, theme for the award. But within the body of Islamic countries, there are very varying cultural traditions, uh, ethnic characteristics, climatic conditions, and the award is seeking to encourage good architecture within the spirit of Islam, but within the cultural traditions of each area. The award now, of course, is three years old. The next award will be presented in 1983. During the past three years, what lessons have been learned for the future? Uh, a lot of very interesting lessons. I think, first of all, the fact that there is more good architecture than maybe was known, uh, because a lot of what has been built recently has not been recorded in the sense that it's relatively new. Secondly, we're at the beginning of a search. There are no definite answers for any category of building. We're seeking to establish objectives, to establish methods to achieve the results we want. But it really is the beginning.